I've sensed a strong desire for doing things differently, which let's face it, across the sectors is what we're aware of and what we need to feel more of, I think. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a lecturer, a climate corruption reporter and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic and political crises that we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. My guest this week is Owen Shears. Owen is a writer, a poet, and a professor in creativity and English literature at Swansea University. Owen is also the co-founder of Black Mountains College, the world's first climate crisis college. The inaugural BA launches this September, Sustainable Futures, Arts, Ecology and Systems Change. Owen joined me to discuss the college and the degree program in full how the idea for the college came about, the fact that it's going to be taught in a very different style to the institutions that we see churning out degrees that he says are for the Industrial Revolution, how they are preparing what he hopes will be change makers to go out into the world and radically overhaul the systems that we need in order to build a sustainable future. He talks about the teaching methods that they're going to be employing, about the fact that there will be no faculties. Instead, this will be an interdisciplinary degree that attracts scientists, artists, creative practitioners, professional people, in order to give the kind of holistic education that we need to understand the world that we live in and understand, of course, how to change it. Importantly, they've decided to imbue creativity throughout the degree. So creative practice is a huge part of the three-year program at Black Mountains College. Owen says this beautiful line in the interview where the idea of creative practice is to learn how to listen, how to observe, how to capture, how to understand the world around us. Black Mountains College is truly an extraordinary attempt at the radical kind of change that we do need to see if we are to adequately educate our young people about what is happening and hopefully what they can do about it. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. If you're loving the show, support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com or on Patreon. The link is in the description box below. By signing up, you'll also get access to the weekly article I write inspired by each interview. Thank you to everyone who has signed up and is supporting the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who keep the project going every week. Owen, thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thank you so much. Dirk and Marianne, it's lovely to be here. Could you tell us all about Black Mountains College, what it is and how it came into existence? Wow, well, I'm not sure I can tell you all about it. It's... it's um. It's mm -hmm. a big idea, but I hope it's a simple idea. Um, so Black Mountains College is, we hope, um, a new kind of higher education, um, a form of higher education and an institution that, although our strap line is teaching the future, uh, is really about now. It's about being serious about the ecological situation now and um, acknowledging, I think, the power of education, hopefully, to, to move the dial and to shift the narrative in that it's a college in, um, in the Black Mountains of Wales. Uh, it's set on a 120-acre farm campus. And it's been built on the model of the American Liberal Arts College. Um, so in the sense that although it's called liberal arts, it will teach across the complete spectrum of uh, uh, disciplines and uh, specialities. And it will only teach a single... Um, a single undergraduate degree in sustainable futures, arts, ecology, and systems change. So it's an entire college, but it's kind of a, a single course. And as you can tell from that title, it's a course that we hope uh, is absolutely focused on the central questions of our time, of systemic change, of addressing the ecological crisis. Um, and we hope that it's a course that will provide graduates with the skills that they need in a changing world where we are all going to have to adapt and change to what's coming down the line, but that will also provide the graduates that we need as a world. I mean, what we hope to produce mm. is uh, change makers. Um, and although it's a single degree, 
students can follow sort of multiple threads and braids through that degree. Because you know, as you and as I'm sure all of your subscribers will understand, the climate crisis, the ecological crisis, it's a wicked problem. You can't address it by following a single discipline. Um, it's entirely interrelated, and our and our learning in the face of it has to be as well. Um, so you know, this isn't going to work if we stay within our silos. So I'm speaking to you from Swansea University, where I also work, where we have faculties, we have schools. There will be no faculties at Black Mountains College. Um, we'll maybe talk more about the specific methods of teaching. But everybody is pulling in the same, um, well, along the same mission in terms of that single degree, even if they are coming from multiple different disciplines. All right, and why the choice to only focus on a single degree? Will that change in the future? There aren't any plans for that to change in terms of the undergraduate study. Um, we have already started teaching further education, vocational courses, uh, which again are focused at, um, at future skills. And we've been surprised, but maybe we shouldn't have been, that even though we haven't launched our undergraduate degree, that will launch in September 23, we've had lots of requests about MA and a PhD study. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's an area that we'll be very much looking to expand into. And also another area, which was always part of the plan, but we're not sure when this will happen exactly, is that we would like to offer ourselves you know, as a place where existing institutions can also send their students, send their faculty for a certain amount of time to think and play and be different. <laughs> um, mm. you know, uh, because I think there's significant frustration in existing institutions where you have lots of individuals who are doing brilliant work in this area but they're lacking a sense of coherence, a sense of, sort of institutional support. And sometimes they understand why it's hard for the institutions to give us. So if we can sort of be an area where that can happen, then great as well. But I think the idea of a single undergraduate degree, because it's on that liberal arts model and actually you can follow various areas of interest within it, I think that will remain the central model, partly because I think it is a statement of intent, isn't it? You know, I've always seen, um, I'm um, a writer, so that's my background. And I've sort of increasingly seen the climate crisis and the ecological crisis as a failure of narrative on the level of a species. Mm -hmm. And in the face of obviously counter narratives, very powerful counter narratives, which you know, you've done fantastic work um, exposing. But I think, I think education is, is such a powerful way, as I've said, to change that narrative, you know where we choose to focus in our teaching and our learning, how we choose to learn and teach, just says so much, I think, to a wider society, to students, to future employers, about where we need to be placing our emphasis. And um, so I think there's, there's a power in that central degree and its, and its main headline, Sustainable Futures, to kind of hopefully focus the minds of everyone. Absolutely. So there's so many different bits that I want to go off on. Um, before, before continuing then with Black Mountains College, I mean, how did this come about? In what way do you see education failing to meet the demands of the climate crisis and failing to prepare young people? That might be a bit complicated for, for you sitting in Swansea University as we do this interview, but <laughs> if you could be as honest as possible. <laughs> no, um, I think I can be as honest as I want to be because I've had very honest conversations here. You know, I mean... It's not like people at Swansea University are wanting to ignore the program um, uh, and they're not wanting to ignore the um, issues either. Um, but they are working within existing systems. And as we know, so many of our existing systems are rigid and yet we need to have systemic change. Um, so I would argue that the current higher education system in Britain is still really built for the Industrial Revolution. You know, that, that idea of single subject study um, and even the more vocational, well, I'd say especially the more vocational courses still geared towards a world of work, uh, which is hydrocarbon intensive, uh, um, strangely sort of a world of work that would apparently have no place for AI and everything else that's coming down the line. Um, mm. So I think it's not just on a lack of focus on what it means to build an ecologically focused society. I, I think there are other elements that aren't working for 
for students as well, which we hope to address. But in terms of how the idea came about, maybe how lots of ideas come about with a bottle of wine beside a fire, um, with my co-founder, Ben Rawlins, <laughs> who's also a writer. But it also came about because of place. Um, so I'm from Wales. Ben isn't originally, but we both moved into the Black Mountains at around the same time. And we were living either side of um, what was once called the Mid Wales Hospital. It had been um, a TB hospital, then it was um, a mental institution. Uh, and when it was up and running, this was not just an economic kind of engine for the community, but sort of a cultural engine as well. And the village that we live in, which is now, like so many rural areas, you know, there are, are real issues with uh, rural poverty and the good public transport. And it was very different when the hospital was up and running. So the conversation started with, you know, what would it look like if we had an organization in a rural area, in a rural setting, that was an engine for a different kind of economic regeneration, cultural regeneration, different kind of renewal. And over the course of that evening, we, we'd both been interested in the climate and ecological emergencies. I, I wrote my first piece for The Promise about it in 2007, and it felt urgent. And then you know, Ben has done lots of human rights work, so it's obviously sort of rubbed up against it as well. And it was, as early, it was sort of that evening we said, well, you know, a college for the climate crisis. Wouldn't that be something? Mm. And I should say, I know that one of your previous guests has been Sophie Howe, the uh, Wellbeing, of, Wellbeing for Future Generations Act, a commissioner from Wales. We were also aware of the Future Generations Act. And one way that we thought about the college initially was sort of a college for the Future Generations Act, a college that would try to make manifest, you know, those seven goals and those five ways of working. Mm. So that's where it began. And we're talking six or seven years ago. And the short story is that Ben and I went, we talked to Welsh government, we talked to various other sort of philanthropic funders. And a lot of people felt that the idea was too radical um, mm -hmm. to be placing an institution like this in a very rural area, to be potentially focusing on a single subject, to be trying to shake up how how students will be taught because we're using a method called the block method of teaching, which was pioneered by Quest University in Ontario, which the essence of that is that students study a single, a single so element, a single module for four weeks. There's no other demands on their time. So it's attractive for students, lots of contact hours, and hopefully attractive for faculty because you have those students for those four weeks. Mm -hmm. Within you know, within certain bounds, you can do what you want with them. And so you're free to teach how you want to. And there's no, <clears throat> and there's no faculty hierarchy. So it's all about teaching. And so, yeah, we were told it was too radical. I did come and have a meeting with the pro vice chancellor at Swansea University. And I think, again, he was very honest. He said, my first response is, I want to be doing this here. But I feel like I can't because we're like an oil tanker that it's going to take a long time to turn. And I think he was right. He said, you know, he said, you're probably better off going off and trying to start this from scratch yourselves. So that was the genesis. That was the start. And obviously, it's been, hmm. in some ways, it's been, it's felt like a long journey. But also, actually, to be launching our degree now in September feels like it has happened very quickly. And I guess the last thing I'll say on this subject is what's been extraordinary, which is both, you know, there are positives and negatives. It feels as though the world and the situation is caught up. And suddenly the, idea, mm. suddenly the idea doesn't feel radical at all. It feels urgent and of its time. You know? mm. I, I understand that you've had quite a lot of interest from academics in the UK and abroad hoping to throw their hat in the mm. ring and help. Can you speak to the situation that academics are sort of suffering from within these big oil tanker-like institutions, especially those whose work is on earth systems and the climate crisis, but see the education system fail it for failing to meet the demands of a sustainable future. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to that to a certain extent. I can't pretend to have, you know, a comprehensive overview, but certainly the applications we've got have told a story. I think they have told mm -hmm. a story of deep frustration, 
a desire for a sense of purpose, um, a desire for the emphasis to swing towards teaching. Now, obviously, your research, especially in, in this area, is vital, especially in the sciences and renewables and actually across all subject areas. But there has been a sense that, you know, the model that we're proposing means that that, that research can happen. And I should have said that the aspiration was always to be the opposite of the college on the hill, to be very much imbricated in the local community. So further education courses are taught in, in existing organizations and charities. Our students will have real world placements. And actually the third year dissertation is to solve a real world problem in the immediate area. So there are research elements, but they're very much real world uh, research elements. But in terms of the undergraduate degree, uh, the emphasis is upon teaching. And I think there's been a sense of frustration among some academics that they're not getting to teach how they'd like to teach and to the extent that they would like to teach. But I think the overriding impression I got, it goes back to that concept of uh, getting out of the silos. You know, um, I'm in various climate groups here in Swansea and they're really impressive and they're from geography and they're from science and they're, and they're from creative writing. So people are managing to make those interdisciplinary spaces, having to do it sort of on their own while still carrying the burden of the existing system, which works within those silos. Um, and that's what I would say was the central story, that you felt a sense of relief that people might be able to come somewhere. And the entire institution, the entire system was about asking questions. How do we create sustainable mm. futures? Um, how do we learn, actually? And, and, you know, the majority of the learning at Batmatters College will be, will be outdoors. And that's not just because we feel that everyone needs to reconnect with their ecological surroundings. It's also based on the neuroscience of how we learn, and how we retain information, and how much more efficiently that happens outdoors. So I think there's been all mm. sorts of things that have uh, appealed to academics, I'm not going to pretend that we're going to get everything right. You know, we are, we're a living experiment. Um, but there's, yeah, I've sensed a strong desire for doing things differently, which let's face it across the sectors is what we're aware of and what we need to feel more of, I think. Let's talk about the degree program. What are you going to be teaching and what kind of academics will you be inviting uh, to teach on this course? That's a great question. So the central question for the first year for undergraduates is essentially how can we learn in a changing world? Um, and that's focusing on things like earth systems, um, obviously, you know, sort of climate change, climate science, um, ecology. And there will be six sort of mandatory uh, core modules within three areas in that first year. So systems change. And as you can tell, you know, that phrase is coming up again and again, because for me, so mm -hmm. much of the work I'm involved in, it's about shifting that emphasis away from individual behavior change towards yeah. systemic change. And what excites me is the concept of systems starting to imagine with us. And what does that look like? You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I did a piece of work a few years ago about the founding of the NHS, and it's really changed how I think about what is possible and how politics shouldn't be the art of the possible, but should be the art of the impossible. And the, yeah. You know, in two years, and it was only half his brief, in two years, um, Anira and Bevan, along with others, of course, brought something into being that came into being on the stroke of midnight, and something that even on the day before it happened, the majority of the press, the majority of the medical community couldn't, they literally couldn't imagine what free healthcare for everyone would look like. And I think it's a great example mm. for us, that leap from, from vision into action. Uh, because we know that what we face is a challenge of the imagination. Um, so I've slightly gone off on one there, but I suppose... It... No, 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 no. I mean, could you actually, could you tell that story for I'm, I don't even know actually the origins of the NHS. Well, I know. I, well, go away and research it because it is inspiring. There's a great book of Bevan speeches. And um, I mean, not just because I'm Welsh. I'm also fascinated where it came from. It was sort of born from a very particular a political environment in a single town in the Welsh Valleys, um, Tredegar, 
where Bevan was from, it, he happened to be there at a time. Having gone down the mines at 13, you know, it was fascinating watching, hearing about him facing Churchill, born in Blenheim Palace, and there's Bevan you know, down the mines at 13, these two great orators facing each other. Um, but there was a real environment, and so Bevan sums it up. He said, we were a generation who did not ask what we could be, but what we could do. And I really feel that's where we are again. And so when he proposed um, a system of healthcare, um, sort of health equality, there was obviously, there was opposition from the Tories who voted against it uh, many times, but there was huge opposition in the press, opposition from the medical community, opposition from within the Labour Party. Um, and I suppose you could question, you know, how wise was it or how, how right it was to sort of to carry on in the face of all of the opposition, but Bevan and his supporters did um, and had to use all sorts of techniques to win people around and to get them on side. Um, and I've always been fascinated by something that he stuck to, although he was advised again and again to you know, phase it in over a period of months or years. He sort of understood, he said, no, this is a change that has to happen over midnight because then everyone needs to feel it immediately. And, you know, and also it brought about extraordinary advancement in technology and science. So the first NHS hearing aid was, was better than anything anyone had ever seen before. And so it was that kind of, it was that level of ambition in the founding of the NHS mm. that I feel is something that we can really learn from. And it's a lesson that, you know, beautiful and radical ideas can happen and they can make good things happen. So hopefully we'll be teaching some of that in the first year. Um, but also in that first year, in those areas, there's, um, there's another core area, which is about learning how to learn and learning how we learn, learning how other people learn. But there's also um, an element of creative practice, uh, which is why the, the degree is called Art, Psychology and Systems Change. So everyone in that first year will have to do some sort of elements of uh, creative practice be that creative writing, um, uh, uh, music, uh, dance and movement, your know, life drawing, art. Um, and that's not about pursuing these with, a, with the aim of excellence. It's about what these practices give you as a human um, and as someone who we hope will go out into the world and will, and will have learned how to look and how to listen and how to imagine. Um, because, you know, I do believe that the current education system obviously you know, channels us towards what we're good at, our talents. And to kind of experiment with this myself, I did um, a pottery course recently because I knew I was, I was crap at it. And, um, and I'm still not very good at it. But it's fascinating being far down the learning curve and doing something you're not naturally good at. Uh, it really teaches you about your own learning. It's a very humbling experience. And I had six weeks of thinking with my hands, which I don't normally do. And so I've, mm. undoubtedly, I've been changed through that process. So that's the first year. I won't take you in such detail through the rest of the year. I will be here all day. But the second year is really asking the question, how can we address some of the most urgent challenges that face us? Um, and some of the core areas there are around leadership, um, design thinking, and it's where people will start to build on their specialisms. You know, some students will be choosing to go towards the systems change side of things, others towards the ecology. Some might be staying more in the arts kind of channel, but still braiding from the others. And in that second year, there'll also be areas of focus in agroecology, food systems, societal systems for, uh, for change for future generations. And also, again, the element of creative practice, but again, with a focus on future generations. And then the third year, as I said, is this, is this real world you know, problem solving. In terms of who we want to have uh, teaching there, I mean, I think, as you can tell, there's an emphasis on interdisciplinary you know, practice and learning. And so we do want people who have some of that experience. But one of the beauties of the block method of teaching is we hope that we can be attracting existing practitioners, people who are right to use a sort of <laughs> fossil fuel um, analogy, who are right at the coalface of their, you know, 
of their specialism because they can come to us for four weeks um, and they can have those students, they can teach their module and then they can go off and do what they're doing. So mm. yes, we will have academics involved with the college, but not, but not just academics. And we're already building, I hope, a really interesting and as international as possible, a stable of what we're calling visiting faculty who might come and teach short courses, might do a single online talk. Um, so I did a climate project recently in a collaboration with some organizations in Bangladesh, and there are some brilliant climate scientists and filmmakers from Bangladesh who we're hoping to have involved either in person or perhaps more likely, um, online. Um, mm. and at the same time, the further education courses will be continuing as well. I, I, I mean, obviously as an organization, we have to be careful to grow too quickly. The other hunger that we've detected is kind of for online and in-person short courses for people who aren't at the college, but just for the general public. Mm. And also it has to be said, and I think this could be a really important stream of our work also within the corporate sector. And yes, I'm not going to lie. Of course, we have to have revenue streams, although once we're up to our full student body, we think it's a fully sustainable business model. But I think mm -hmm. taking some of the Black Mountains College thinking and teaching and taking it into the heart of corporates, I, I hope yeah. might be one of the most important things that we can do. And I'm pleased to say we have yeah. had genuine interest from some areas that you wouldn't necessarily expect to get it from. Because I think we're starting to mm -hmm. see that employers understand they need, you know, climate literate you know, graduates. Well, yes, I hope so too. I think they are seeing it. Um... It's just so obvious that what the future demands is a completely new way of thinking. And how do you shape an educational degree or a learning program around inspiring that change? I wonder as well, because I know that you have a, a youth board who's advising. Mm. Have you worked closely with high school or university students to also develop this curriculum based on what they think that they might want or need? Yeah, that's a really, that, that's a really great question as well. The honest answer is probably not as much as we would have liked to. Um, okay. because there was a sense that we needed to get up and running, but a lot of that, that youth board were in school uh, very recently. Um, we are, we've been working with people like, um, Amaya Rose Craig and her organization, Black to Nature. We've had some ecological youth camps who have come from all over Britain. They have very much fed into the, the thinking and the ideas. Um, and Ben and others are now going out into schools a lot more, partly just to tell people about Black Mountains College, but also it's, it's a two-way process. You're absolutely right. It's a dialogue to find out, not just students, because let's face it, it's parents who choose courses as well. And that's something that we, <laughs> we're not quite up to speed yet. But I think on our open days, we need to be you know, catering for the students and catering for the parents. Um, mm. So yeah, it is, it's, it's, obviously it was important that we had a structure for the undergraduate degree because it's a way of, sort of setting out our store. And like I say, it's sort of establishing mm -hmm. a narrative. But again, the beauty of the block method and what we have is that there is room for flexibility and flux. And, and we've always really hoped that the pioneer cohort, as we're calling you know, the undergraduates who will join us in September, that in a way, part of their degree, part of their problem solving, I think, will be about contributing to how the college is going to work, both as an academic institution, but also within the area. I mean, I should say, this is going to sound very bold, but the broad canvas idea that I've always loved is the possibility for a learning community to be an engine for a new kind of regeneration which builds towards a version of the 20-minute community where your food and your energy needs are met within your near environment. So, you know, wouldn't it be great Black Mountains College, because we have a dispersed campus, you know, some of our teaching classrooms are going to be in Hay Castle. Because of that, what if that were to drive change? They actually know we need a zero carbon public transport system in this area. We can't have our students getting on diesel buses to go and you learn there, or we need cycleways between here and Hay. It's perfectly doable. In a similar way, part of the 120 yeah. acre farm campus, we want to be about community energy production, solar, hydro, and wind. This is already starting to happen. The fact that we want that to happen 
is putting pressure on Western power to upgrade the grid so that individuals can actually have their own little solar projects as well. So that's the big idea. Wow. It's like, you know, I would love, and I hope other people would love that our area can become like a lab, a lab community with, you know, uh, communal food growing areas and the college is at the heart of it. Um, so mm. you can't do that without ongoing consultation with the, uh, uh, with the community, with your students who are coming into the environment. Cause this isn't somewhere where you can come and you can just do your campus thing. You know, that's even on the level of sports, you know, sports and extra curricular activities. It's really important for students. But what we're saying to our students is, yeah, if you want to play rugby, there is the village rugby club. So you play yeah. with their sport team and with the village cricket team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the same with drama. So it's a, it's a different experience of education, I hope, as well. And what do you hope these graduates will go out in the world and do and achieve? I hope they'll save us. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, I hope that too. <laughs> <laughs> Although, even as I say that, I've been aware of this for so long. There's a really insidious narrative of passing the buck, saying, "Aren't the youth amazing? Aren't they incredible?" And like, you know, mm. we've cocked it up for them, but they're going to solve it. But I partly joke. Mm. But as I said, we do want to make change makers, but we want to send those change makers into every kind of discipline. And we assume that many will probably go on and do graduate study. But the example I always give is, you, you know, some of them might become hedge funders, but there'll be hedge fund managers who have laid a hedge and who understand the essential ecosystems upon which we rely to survive. You know, maybe that's an extreme example, but that's what I mean is it, there's no reason why our graduates can't go into relatively conventional jobs. In many ways they should. I would love some of them to be going in to Sainsbury's and Waitrose and going, this is nowhere near good enough. We can have a completely different system of food supply and so yeah i mean i know that sounds like we want everything but there shouldn't be any restrictions on where these on where these graduates go um because what they will also have as well as i hope a deep ecological understanding is an understanding of systems change so it's a big ask it's a big ask and we haven't launched yet so i can't tell you exactly i mean and there are maybe competing desires we know that one of the things we're interested in is you know helping to fuel um a different kind of rural entrepreneurship you know, one of the other reasons actually I've forgotten this one of the other reasons that ben and i landed upon a college was because when we looked at the paris county council audit there was one area that was in purple which means catastrophic oh, i know and that was demographic age change just the young either choosing or being forced to leave the area and an increasing sort of elderly population. One of the aims of the Future Generations Act is um, cohesive society, an intergenerational society. And so we thought if some of our graduates actually stay, start businesses with that sustainable focus in the area, then great. And I should have said, actually, we've recently signed an agreement with... Um, Brecon Beacons National Park and so we're kind of the first college of a national park and they're having an extraordinary moment of transition they're about to launch a new management plan which you know I don't often find things that hopeful in, in this area I'm sure you, like you it can be hard sometimes but it, mm. it, it is properly radical it's being honest about the state of nature within the park which is more depleted than outside the park it's being ambitious. Right. Wow. Yeah. I know. Being ambitious mm. in terms of trying to establish donor economics across the whole region. Um, Excellent. Yeah. No, no. And that's just the start of it. So the fact that's happening and we're there, um, hope we're kind of creating a wider environment where some of these graduates will want to stay and put their shoulders to the wheel as well. It's, I kind of want to push back on the idea that, that some of these people will, these graduates might, well, I don't know, become hedge fund managers, yeah. which is quite a radical thing to say. <laughs> um, 
because it's quite contrary to this idea of how of how the NHS was born. And it was uh, another podcast guest who quoted Martin Luther King to me and said, you know, incrementalism will be the death of us. Yeah. Um, and surely part of what we need to be saying to young people, and I think part of what the world is showing to them is that the opportunities for them to make change don't particularly exist in, in current systems because the systems are so rigid and so mimetic and so self-producing that really sort of the hope for for them, for their futures, for difference, for newness, for sustainability lies in being creative out, outside of it almost. Like, have we not kind of reached the stage now where we think, oh yeah, no, I'll get into the system and then I'll change it from the inside. No, you won't. People are like, that's just not, that's just not how it's how it's working, really. The only place yeah. where that can happen is, you know, at the very, very top. Well, I mean, of course I agree with you. I agree with you. And I've been sort of, <laughs> and I've been kind of immersed in that area for a long time and finding it frustrating. And you know, Ben and I went to a really fascinating conference in West Wales uh, uh, called Moving Beyond. And what was interesting about the ambition of it was the spectrum of who was there. So you did, you had climate lawyers and climate activists and climate scientists. And then you also had um, executives from BP and Shell and Nat West. And when you look at that room, to start off with, you think, where is anyone going to find shared territory? Now, the positive thing was, was that people did find some shared territory. But you're absolutely right. There was a moment that became increasingly frustration that when you started to push against questions of like changing company law, which we know could be one of the most impactful things that we could do, or properly mm -hmm. shifting the systems or actually doing away with the systems, you cannot dismantle your master's yeah. house with your master's tools, huge pushback yeah. from the corporate sector, but also it's a strong word to use, but an element of ignorance. And there was real fear in the other part of the room. And I hate to sort of make it binary, but it was because the actions that the corporates were taking were in no way commensurate with the science. And that was when one of the young people stood up from the Advocacy Academy in Brixton, brilliant, brilliant organization. And she said, I spend a lot of my time working with youth climate activists. And because of that, I spend a lot of my time feeling hopeful. In the three days I spent here, I felt totally hopeless. Gosh. And that was a shock to the room. And the reason she did was for exactly what you said. Feels as though the opportunities to make change aren't there. So yeah, I was being slightly geeked when I said graduate, I become a hedge funder. But I'm going to come in on something you said unless it's at the top. Mm -hmm. Sounds grandiose, but I guess we want to get our people to the top as quick as possible and have other graduates working yeah. from the bottom and, you know, working from every side. Um, but you're right. It, it's about graduates going into other areas where they can be talking about a narrative, alternative systems. And I think just making yeah. that imagination feel, feel possible. I mean, I'm a writer, but you know, and my background is poetry and theatre. And the first climate piece I wrote was an oratorio. But what I'm absolutely focused on now is mainstreaming the narrative. Mainstream, mainstream, mainstream. So, like, mm. I'd like our graduates to be going into reality TV um, and news mm. and journalism, obviously. But, you know, yeah. those places where you can actually make a real impact with story. Mm. Yeah. That is so fascinating, isn't it, actually? Imagine one of your graduates, and I've never seen Love Island, but I know th about it from the internet. Imagine that being, or like Big Brother, I don't know if Big Brother's still running, uh, or I don't know any of them. Yes, and having somebody there banging on about yeah. these in super important issues, reaching the biggest, a bigger audience than any of us could imagine. Yeah. But not only yeah, that, that's good stuff. But not only that, but also coming mm. up with a new TV format, which are very watchable and very attractive. Partly saying this because I've got about 10 up my sleeve that I'm trying to get made. But, well, that tells a story as well, doesn't it? Go on. Well, no, no, I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to give, I'm not going to give over my pitch and let someone else, no, no. Um, <laughs> actually, I'll talk about them very happily because I just want them, I want them to happen. But maybe that's a whole separate conversation. But, um, well, actually, I'll just mention one because it, it's an example. So there's a form yeah. of TV called Living History where, you know, you place a couple of families in an Edwardian house, a, a Torian house, you know, coal house. And then we learn about history through that. And I thought, well, isn't it time we flipped it? Wales 
Um, the Welsh government has officially said it wants to be net zero by 2035. The brilliant Jay Davison is, is leading a task group which month by month are, are publishing their recommendations for sector by sector. And I said, well, let's flip it. Let's try and jump an entire community, an entire village into 2035 and have that as a mm. form of big brother. But, but trace what happens when it's not about individual change. Trace what happens when we put people in systems that have changed, you know. But to come back to your point, where we really want the future BMC graduates is as the gatekeepers, as the commissioners. Because an idea like that, you take to the commissioner. And the pushback you guess is, well, we don't want to make anything too worthy. You know, always fascinated why just what's happening is, is worthy. And they say, well, it feels a, a bit down the line. Don't we need sort of program ideas more, which are about asking what might engage climate change? It just feels like there's this time lag. So to come back to the college, though, that's what I mean, is you want, mm. you want graduates coming up with the program ideas. You want them sort of being on those commissioning panels. Yeah. It, it's a big ask. The other thing we would love, is like I've always thought Wales is a small nation. The best thing that we can give the world is blueprints of progressive ideas. So in a way, we did that. The NHS, that was, that was happening on a small scale in the mining communities. Yeah. We've done that with the Future Generations Act. Could argue that Howell Var did it with his laws back in the, whenever it was, 14th, 15th century. So if Black Mountains College can be an example, a, a blueprint, especially for a different kind of rural regeneration, then the main thing we want to happen is that we want other people to copy us. You know, let's see these institutions cropping up all over, please. Please. Oh, excellent. Oh, and I can keep you all day, but I know that we have to wrap up. This is just, it's just extraordinary. It's amazing what Wales is achieving and quite modestly in the sidelines, it seems, of the UK while the rest of the island is crumbling. Um, and Black Mountains College really does seem absolutely extraordinary. And I cannot wait to see how your inaugural degree starts. And if anybody is listening who would like to apply, um, you can just Google it and get on top of it. Now, my final question for you would be, who would you like to platform? Have you had, um, she's sort of come more to the fore recently because I, I think she's, she's co-written a bill. Um, is it with the Green Party? I can't quite remember. No, someone else. But anyway, incredible youth campaigner called Scarlet Western. Um, I don't know if you've had her. Scarlet Western. She was the youngest person no. to get her politics A-level, I think at 13. Um, she, wow. Yeah, she's, she's still very, very young. Um, sorry, I'm not quite up to speed. She's just co-authored um, a climate bill, sort of an, an opposition climate bill, because the government's one is so, so tawdry. Um, yeah, so Scarlett Westbrook came straight to mind. She'd be great. 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 Wonderful. Owen, thank you so much for your time. No, well, thank you so much, Rachel. Dilchabad, Galon, as we say in Wales. Thanks from the heart. If you want to learn more about Black Mountains College and read Owen's work, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to this channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. If you loved it, support Planet Critical on Patreon, where you can also read my weekly essays inspired by each podcast interview. The Patreon link is in the description box below. As always, thank you to the Planet Critical community who support the show and make all of this work possible. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week.